Hello everyone, and welcome back to Scary Interesting. In this video, we're going to go over three stories about situations that at face value seem totally harmless, but it's exactly this false sense of security that resulted in something going horrifyingly wrong for the people involved. As always, viewer discretion is advised. By the fall of 2016, 23-year-old Corey McKeek was a handsome Royal Air Force Airman with a bright future. However, like many young men his age, he also had a wild side that often included bouts of heavy drinking with his friends. Then, early one morning in September of 2016, he simply vanished under mysterious circumstances. Afterward, a number of theories emerged that included everything from kidnapping to murder. But either way, Corey was never seen again. This case has technically never been solved, but the evidence suggests that he died an odd and tragic, but not altogether unexpected end. Corey was born in the Scottish town of Perth on September 16, 1993. Corey then went on to attend the local high school, but already by the age of 15, his father suspected he had a drinking problem. However, it's been suggested that unlike most teenagers who are just experimenting, this was in response to him discovering the remains of a friend who had been hit by a train and found it difficult to cope. But even so, he finished his studies, signed on with the Royal Air Force, and was eventually assigned to the number two squadron at the Royal Air Force Base in Huntington. By most accounts, he had a relatively normal and uneventful career with the Royal Air Force. While in service, he traveled to France, Africa, and South America, and made a number of close friendships along the way. So at least from a distance, it seemed like things were going well, and that he'd finally found his place in the world. He even had a beautiful new girlfriend named April, who worked as a fitness instructor. They'd only been dating for a few months, but things were going amazingly well. Maybe the only issue they had revolved around Corey's drinking. It was often a point of concern for both April and Corey's best friend. You see, Corey was often the life of the party, but he definitely wasn't the kind of guy who could stop drinking after a few glasses, and he regularly got way more intoxicated than his friends. Then one day, after a long week on base, Corey and a few friends decided to enjoy a night out in Bury St. Edmunds on Friday, September 23rd, 2016. Before driving into town, Corey had a few drinks in his apartment at the Royal Air Force Base. It's not clear exactly how much he had to drink, but he may have already been over the legal limit before heading into town. By then, Corey had a history of excessive drinking, but he usually slept it off before attempting to drive back to base from Bury St. Edmunds. Walking home was also never an option because the airbase was about 10 miles or 16 kilometers northeast of town. So instead, Corey had slept in his car on more than one occasion, and friends said that he sometimes passed out in empty lots, under trash bags, and on one occasion a few years before, inside a commercial garbage bin. That night, after a little bar hopping, Corey and his friends ended up at a popular nightclub, but just after midnight, he was so inebriated that bouncers told him he had to leave. However, despite what witnesses described as being extremely intoxicated, he left without causing a fuss. According to a bouncer working the door that night, he hung around outside, talking with other people for about an hour. Then sometime before 1am on the morning of the 24th, he walked to a pizza place just a few blocks away. Corey finished his food and left the restaurant about 20 minutes later. By then, he hadn't any alcohol for nearly 90 minutes, but neither the food nor the fresh air did much good. A few minutes after leaving the pizza place, he was slumped against the door of a local business, and shortly thereafter, he fell asleep on the sidewalk for approximately two hours. Then, at 3.25 a.m., a CCTV camera captured him standing up and walking unsteadily towards a garbage container staging area behind a cluster of businesses. Corey was never seen leaving the era, and as far as anyone knows, no one ever laid eyes on him again. By the afternoon of Monday the 26th, Royal Air Force officials reported him missing when he failed to show up for work. Corey's friends and family members were understandably concerned, but since he'd only been gone a few days, they held out hope he'd show up no worse for wear. On a positive note, investigators didn't find any blood or evidence that a crime had been committed in the area that night. In addition, there were no reports of screams or loud arguments like there probably would have been if there was a fight, a mugging, or an abduction. Thanks to camera footage, investigators were able to trace Corey's steps from the time he entered the pizza place until he left and walked to the garbage collection area. But after that, it was anyone's guess where he went or what happened to him. Initially, although it wasn't widely publicized, some investigators noted similarities between Corey's disappearance and the attempted kidnapping of another Royal Air Force serviceman just a few miles away earlier that summer. This lead was pursued, but ultimately turned out to be a dead end. Investigators also considered that he might have accepted a ride from someone he didn't know or was dragged into a vehicle while passed out. His mother even said that he probably would have gotten into a car with a stranger because he regularly offered rides to people walking along the roads in rural areas. Investigators also considered that Corey walked back to the Royal Air Force Base and got lost or was hit by a driver who fled from the scene. Police then searched roads and railway lines in the area but never turned up a thing. 
So with little else to go on, investigators refocused their attention on the camera footage to see what else it might reveal. This time, they focused on the other people in the cars that came through the area and found that four vehicles and nearly 40 individuals had been through the area between 3 and 5 a.m. on the morning of September 24th. Then, of the four vehicles that had entered the area, one was a commercial garbage truck, and this is where things took an unexpected turn. Because Corey was so drunk that night, investigators theorized that he might have entered the bin to keep warm, fell asleep, got tipped into the truck with the rest of the garbage, was crushed by the compactor, and then got dumped at a landfill a few hours later. They then contacted the garbage company, and company officials told investigators that their truck's lifting mechanisms weighed each bin before it was emptied. However, that night, the only bin their truck picked up in that area weighed just 24 pounds, or about 11 kilograms. If this information was correct, Corey couldn't have been in the bin because he weighed nearly 200 pounds, or 91 kilograms. But then, even more strangely, it appeared as though his phone had been in the bin, even if Corey hadn't been. Records from the phone company showed that its movements matched the truck's route until 8 a.m. on the morning of the 24th, at which point the phone went dead. It's not clear exactly how this was discovered, and whether it was intentional or an honest error, but investigators eventually found that the garbage company had given them incorrect information. The actual weight of the bin picked up that night was nearly 256 pounds, or 116 kilograms, and not a tenth of that like they were initially told. Also, according to the company's own records, this was nearly five times heavier than the average bin weight recorded from the area in previous months. At this point, it was seeming more and more likely what happened to Corey. Later that month, police began a long and thorough search of the local landfill. Based on GPS coordinates and the garbage truck driver's own account of where he dumped the garbage that night, police decide to search a 900 square meter patch of landfill down to a depth of 25 feet or 7.5 meters. By May, officers and investigators had sifted through approximately 3,000 tons of waste. They found a number of items that had been disposed of by businesses in the area at the time of Corey's disappearance, but neither he, his phone, or any of his personal belongings ever turned up. The effort continued until early June, but by then, the trail had gone cold. The following October, police began searching another landfill in the area. They also inspected waste that had been incinerated, hoping to find teeth and bone fragments that belonged to Corey. However, these efforts were all fruitless, and the search was officially called off the following spring. Corey's inquest wasn't convened until March of 2022. At the coroner's court, jury members sat through weeks of testimony from friends, family members, co-workers, and investigators. As sad and uncomfortable as it was to hear, everyone agreed that Corey had a drinking problem, that he regularly made poor decisions when he was drunk, and that he was extremely intoxicated the night he disappeared. In addition, he often wound up in odd places and passed out in and around trash collection areas. Unsurprisingly, jurors concluded that he entered the bin, got tipped into the truck, was crushed by the compactor, and dumped at a landfill, just like police suspected from the very beginning. Corey's mother, father, and brothers agreed with the verdict wholeheartedly, and although they were all heartbroken, they finally had some sense of closure. Tragically, eight months after Corey's disappearance, April gave birth to a baby girl. Although she didn't know it at the time, she had been pregnant with Corey's baby at the time of his disappearance. There was still a week remaining in a three-week holiday to Sydney, Australia, when 71-year-old Bernard left the apartment he was staying in on January 6, 2017. In the 1990s, his daughters moved to Sydney, and so along with his wife Angela, 50 years, he was a regular visitor there. Another year of Christmas and New Year's holidays were now behind them, but Bernard and Angela were retirees, so there was no rush to get back to their home in Tasmania. One of Bernard's favorite activities was walking, and almost daily, he'd go on walks that would last up to three hours, leaving him feeling refreshed and vibrant. The year before, in 2016, Angela noticed that Bernard had started sleeping more and for longer than usual. Since Bernard despised going to see a doctor for anything that might be serious, Angela encouraged him to go to get a sore toe checked out so she could notify his doctors of this other issue. In the end, Bernard was prescribed pills intended to reduce the impact of dementia symptoms, and Angela spent three weeks dissolving one into his coffee every morning. The result was bittersweet. His condition greatly improved, but it was confirmed that Bernard had early onset dementia. In the off chance you're not familiar with it, dementia causes memory issues, diminished problem solving, poor judgment, and confusion about times and places. These symptoms aren't always evident, leaving patients feeling and acting normally, but when it comes on, dementia can cause sufferers to get lost or wander aimlessly. In June of 2016, the family was at a shopping center during the early afternoon in Hobart, Tasmania, when they split up and planned to meet each other at the car at a specific time. When Bernard failed to show up, Angela drove home and called the police to report him missing around 6.30 that evening. He was later found at 10 o'clock that night at Hobart City Center, saying he was waiting for Angela and that she was at the hospital. In response to the incident, their son Mark bought a watch with GPS capability that would allow them to immediately locate him if he ever went missing again. 
About six months later, before he left the apartment on January 6th, Bernard spent the morning with Angela watching TV because it had been raining. When the sun came out close to noon, Bernard started getting antsy. Angela, however, was more than content to sit on the couch, so the two agreed to meet for lunch with their daughter Melinda at a nearby shopping center. The plan was to meet outside the Woolworth department store around 1 o'clock. That way, Bernard could get some energy out of his system with a walk first, and Angela could get herself together before meeting him. However, despite their plan, 1 o'clock came and went without any sign of Bernard. When he still hadn't arrived by 1.15, Angela and Melinda started checking some of the stores Bernard liked to visit to see if he had wandered into one of them. At 2 o'clock, without finding him, they decided to leave them all and head back toward Melinda's apartment, keeping an eye out for him on the way. When Melinda opened the front door of her apartment, they found everything just as they had left it, meaning Bernard had not returned. Then, as the evening wore on and the sun started to set, their concern grew, so around 8 o'clock, Melinda picked up the phone and reported him missing. After providing police with a photo of her father, Melinda walked to the mall to speak to management about her father's disappearance and even met with two security officers. Unfortunately, no one had seen him in days past with no new developments. In a plea for help, Mark told the media that his father wouldn't want to be a burden to anyone and likely wouldn't approach someone if he was lost, so finding him would come down to seeing him. Police also held another press conference asking for the public's help, but it produced nothing. It was likely that he was still in Sydney, according to police, but where in Sydney was a mystery. On January 27th, a maintenance worker at the mall was walking through its labyrinth of fire corridors and stairwells hidden just behind the store wall when he made a tragic discovery. In a stairwell behind a store was Bernard, and from the state of decomposition, he had very obviously been dead for some time. His body was almost kneeling like he had fallen forward out of a chair just behind him. Police were then called to the scene and the family was notified. Throughout this particular mall, there are large sets of double doors labeled as fire exits. If you were to go through any of them, however, you wouldn't be outside just yet. Instead, you'd be in a labyrinth of corridors and stairwells that are only open to the public in case of emergency. For context, if you were to straighten this maze out, it would measure over 8 miles or 14 kilometers. One security officer who walked the entire length said it took him 6 hours. Making matters worse for anyone who was lost within them is that nothing was labeled other than warnings not to obstruct the doors. You could be in the parking lot or the basement and never be able to tell the difference. And if that wasn't enough, mixed within the tangled corridors were self-locking doors, meaning once they shut behind you, you weren't getting back through them. There were also no systems to notify security when someone had access to fire doors during a non-emergency, and no security cameras back there at all. An alarm would only sound when someone opened one of the fire doors that led outside. Incredibly, Bernard's death is not the only time something similar had happened. Apparently, a Sydney woman and her mother spent an hour trapped in a stairwell by the self-locking doors. They pounded on the door until the woman found one bar of cell phone reception in one specific spot and used it to look up the number for the mall. She was then able to reach a security officer who talked them to an exit. In 2014 as well, an Irish tourist was reported missing by friends when he was last seen leaving a hotel near the mall. It was sheer luck that a manager at the mall decided to walk some of the hallways and stairwells to ensure his staff had been cleaning them regularly. In this check, he found the tourist. He had been trapped in a stairwell for five days after tumbling down the stairs, resulting in back and head injuries that incapacitated him. Horrifyingly, the cleaning schedule had that particular stairwell slated for cleaning in two more days, and the tourist almost certainly would have been dead by then. In Bernard's case, even more frustratingly, even though they knew he was missing, the security staff in the mall didn't keep track of which staff reviewed what tapes. So although the police had requested all the footage to be checked, it wasn't, and Bernard was never seen. Had it been checked properly, they would have seen Bernard walking around the building and then later back and forth outside the store he was eventually found behind. There was even enough that was off about Bernard that store employees noticed him. When he wandered into their store, one of the assistant managers approached him. She described him as looking frail and staring into the distance, and when she asked him if he needed any help, she said that he was confused and that he couldn't find the people he was supposed to meet up with. The assistant manager offered to help him find them, but he turned it down and left the store. Store employees were apparently so concerned by this that they phoned security to request that they find him on camera and follow him, but it's unknown if any attempt at all was made. The cameras ended up clearly showing Bernard leaving the store and walking toward the fire exit door shortly after. And while not part of the inquest, there was one other tragic factor in Bernard's death. The watch Mark bought for his father and the GPS tracker was broken at the time, so Bernard wasn't wearing it. Right in the middle of Australia, a giant sandstone monolith, known to the Anangu people as Uluru, towers 1140 feet or 348 meters over the outback. This rock has a profound cultural importance for the aboriginal people there, and some say it's an artifact from the creation period when their ancestors shaped the world, and it's hard not to see why. The size and shape of Uluru make it look unnatural as if it were shaped by someone's hand and then put back down in the desert. 
Naturally, it's a popular tourist attraction currently controlled by the Anangu, who were given ownership of the site and the surrounding park in 1985. Walking over the rock has been forbidden since 2017, and any camping and accommodation in the air must be within the resort owned and run by the Aboriginals. But before 1985, things were different. After it was spotted by an explorer in 1873, Uluru was known as Ayers Rock, named after the Chief of Secretary of Australia at the time. For some time after, the Anangu, though not banned, were discouraged from going anywhere near it as roads were built and increasing numbers of tourists headed there. The campsites afterward weren't well regulated either, and people would turn up to the park in such high numbers that walking over Uluru was banned partly because it was damaging the rock. The other thing the park has in the surrounding area is quite a lot of wildlife. A lot of the animals there, like the red kangaroos and wallabies, are usually harmless, but if you camp there, you need to watch out for poisonous snakes and spiders, and you also need to be on the lookout for dingoes. The dingo is Australia's largest land predator, and they're somewhere between a medium-sized dog and a wolf, usually sandy yellow in color, with a head that's a bit like a fox. They have been known to be domesticated by aboriginals, but for the most part, they can be found out in the wild living in burrows. Their opportunistic hunters will take whatever meal they come across, hunting prey and scavenging for what they need. When they catch an animal, they tend to bite it around the throat, cutting its main artery so that it bleeds out quickly. They rarely come near humans, but it does happen every now and then. In August of 1980, Lindy and Michael Chamberlain decide they want to visit what they knew as Ayers Rock. Michael was a minister at the Seventh-day Adventist Church in a mining town in Queensland called Mount Isa. They were both known as deeply moral and generally good people, while Michael's job could be challenging. Lindy, meanwhile, had spent the previous nine weeks looking after their newborn daughter, Azaria. So finally, they thought it was time they took some vacation and went out to see more of their homeland. Even though Mount Isa was more than 620 miles from Uluru and getting there would take a 17-hour drive, they were looking forward to the trip and the stops along the way. Their two sons, Aiden and Reagan, were also excited to see the outback. On August 13th, they set off west, heading up Australia's Route 66 before turning north down the Stewart Highway, then out west again to the top Ayers Rock campground. On the way, they stopped at other sites, picked up hitchhikers, and just enjoyed their trip. They got to Uluru on August 16th, set up camp, and then spent their first uneventful night surrounded by the park's beauty. The next day, the family explored the rock, climbing parts of it and exploring the caves around it. Lindy kept her daughter tight in her arms, following her two sons and husband as they had the time of their lives. A highlight was the fertility cave, which was a sacred space used by the Anangu women when they gave birth. The walls are covered with rock art, and some of it is tens of thousands of years old. Lindy then spotted what looked like a dog in the distance as they made their way out and realized it was a dingo, but it was far enough off that she wasn't too worried. She also wasn't too concerned when more dingoes showed up at the campsite. Not long after nightfall, the family met up with other campers at a row of barbecues and ate dinner. Dingoes were drawn by the food, and one even showed up where the family sat by the barbecue. Michael threw it a piece of crust, and while Aiden chased a mouse, another dingo pounced on it, biting its neck. At about the same time, another camper said she'd been followed by one as she went to take out her trash. All in all, they didn't really seem like a threat, more like playful dogs who'd figured out that getting scraps off the campers was an easy meal. Still, Lindy told Michael that he shouldn't encourage them. A little while later, Lindy headed to the tent with Azaria and their son Reagan to put them to bed for the night, and after about 10 minutes, they fell asleep, so Lindy returned to join the others by the fires. Shortly afterward, some campers say they heard a growl. Others, including Lindy, are sure they heard a baby scream. In one account, Lindy apparently even says she spotted a shape like a dingo coming out of their tent. Whatever the sound, Lindy ran to her tent to investigate, and horrifyingly, Azaria's bassinet was empty and there was a lot of blood covering the floor, the mattress, and the entrance to the tent. In a panic, Lindy then ran outside screaming at the top of her lungs, quote, My God, my God, the dingo's got my baby. Straight away, the campers grabbed their flashlights and ran into the bush around the campsites. Word also quickly got around, and by the following morning, more than 300 people had turned up, forming a human chain to scour the area. During this, they found paw prints leading from the tent and back to the road, but they ended there. Anangu trackers and skilled rangers also came to help and found spots in the dirt that looked kind of like the knitted clothing Azaria had been wearing, but next to them were dark spots that looked like blood. It looked as if the animal had put the baby down to rest before carrying on. Horrifyingly though, they still couldn't find the baby. The police searched every cave they could, and still there was nothing. They then brought in another ranger to shoot as many dingoes in the region as possible and sent them all for forensic analysis. But no matter how many they looked at, there was no evidence that one of them had taken Azaria. As the search continued, Lindy was frantic. Michael, however, seemed to be in a state of shock. Some reports say that when he was asked about his daughter, all he could reply with was hopelessness, that she was probably already dead. 
Over the following days, the search continued with no luck, and then, on August 24th, a man out taking photographs of wildflowers found her jumpsuit and a diaper shredded near Boulder. This was the last sign of Azaria ever found. From the beginning, not everyone believed Lindy's story, and rumors began to spread about a more sinister alternative. Like, for example, there were rumors that Lindy supposedly brought her daughter in for a medical checkup dressed in all black, and that Azaria means sacrifice in the wilderness, and that the baby was killed as a sacrifice for their religion. You see, at the time, many Australians didn't understand Seventh-day Adventists and saw them as some sort of strange cult. Azaria is actually Hebrew for whom God aids, but that didn't stop the press and others from spreading the rumors. Lindy publicly calling the ordeal a trial by Satan didn't help people's view of them either, nor did what were seen as emotionless appeals on TV, even though Lindy swears they edited out the moments when she broke down. Even so, the first inquest found that the baby had been taken by a dingo. It was an in-depth inquest, lasted for months, and calling dozens of witnesses. The coroner concluded that Azira, quote, met her death when attacked by a wild dingo while asleep in her family's tent, end quote. Some people weren't satisfied with that, however, including the police, who carried on investigating as if it were a murder. Then, in late 1981, a forensics expert from the UK looked at Azira's clothes. He then told investigators there was no evidence that a dingo had been anywhere near the clothes they'd found and wanted to know why a white coat she'd been wearing hadn't been found with the other clothes. Then on September 19th, the police raided the Chamberlain's home, seizing hundreds of pieces of evidence, including their car. A second inquest was then held, and experts claimed to have found evidence of blood in the car, that the blood in the clothes was consistent with Azaria's throat being cut, and that the cuts in her jumpsuit could only have been made with scissors. They also raised the question of the missing coat, arguing that it was unlikely that a dingo would tear her clothes off, but not that. This time, the verdict was that it was murder, and Lindy and Michael were charged. Their trial began on September 13, 1982, and from the beginning, the prosecution admitted they didn't have any motive for the murder. However, they claimed they didn't need it because their evidence was strong enough anyway, and tragically, they were right. Despite the eyewitness testimony of so many people, including a hitchhiker they'd picked up who had blood in the car, the jury was convinced by the forensic experts. They claimed that the blood in the car had to have come from Azaria, that the store was inconsistent with dog attacks, and that dingoes didn't attack humans anyway. Even though local witnesses told them about other times dingoes had gone for local children, the experts were seen as more trustworthy. So finally, at 8.37pm on October 28th, Lindy was convicted of the murder and given life in prison. Michael was also found guilty of being an accessory after the fact, and the judge gave him a suspended sentence. Over the next few years upon re-examination, the scientific evidence started to fall apart. First of all, it was found that the jumpsuit could have been torn by an animal after all. It turns out that it had been raining, which may have been why there was no evidence of dingo saliva on the clothes. And then most damning of all, what the forensic scientists had been so confident was Azaria's blood turned out to be paint emulsion left behind by the car factory. However, despite this, Lindy's appeals were rejected and she remained behind bars, subjected to all of the horrors other prison inmates would inflict on people convicted of the crime she'd been convicted of. Three years later, sometime in January 1986, an English hiker went on his own one evening to climb the side of Uluru. He unfortunately slipped and fell to the ground, dying instantly. Most of him was then found on February 4th in an area covered with dingo layers. When police then searched the air for missing bones, they found Azaria's missing white jacket. Lindy's lawyers finally had good evidence that dingoes had taken Azaria. The evidence was so robust that just three days later, Lindy was released from prison pending an appeal. In May of the following year, a judge issued a report condemning the previous trial, slamming the investigators and stating that, quote, if the evidence before the commission had been given at the trial, the trial judge would have been obliged to direct the jury to acquit the Chamberlains on the ground that the evidence could not justify their conviction, end quote. The guilty verdict was finally quashed on September 15, 1988. However, despite all the evidence, a coroner wouldn't rule that a dingo had taken her child once and for all until June 12, 2012. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. If you have a story suggestion, feel free to submit it to the form found in the description, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.